part of the thought process here is that we're trained, taught, and educated that high risk equals high return. But risk defined is chance of loss. So how by increasing your chance of loss is that going to bring you a higher return? When people are telling you high risk equals high return, how much risk do they take? Well, if you're giving your money and they're getting a fee no matter what happens to that money or even bailed out by the government, they didn't take any risk because the game was rigged for them and rigged against you. What's investor DNA, Stolpa? And investor DNA is investing in things that are in alignment with your sole purpose. So making sure that you're focused on things that you have knowledge over, that you understand, rather than diving into something you have very little understanding of and hoping and wishing that it'll work out. But you can use your skills and your everything that you are to make it work right so the key terms there you said focus Mm -hmm. instead of diversify yep diversification is diversification for a lot of people admission of ignorance they don't know it's going to work they spread themselves thin Mm -hmm. Um, abilities or skills you mentioned the word skills yeah like knowing what you're doing right knowledge was another uh, word that you use there and i would even say values because part of that sole purpose conversation which is Mm s-o-u-l is our values our abilities our passions combined for the highest context of our living or our vision yeah so it's investing in things that we know because risk is in the investor not in the investment so people ask all the time is real estate a good investment i'm like depends on who's asking yeah the stock market a good investment Pretty much never. Um, <laughs> the answer maybe slightly is mostly biased no. On that one. Yeah. Um, should I buy a business? It all comes down to who you are and what your investor DNA is. So one of the best tools or resources is you go to wealthfactory.com forward slash scorecard. So risk profile is stupid. Um, risk profile would say, hey, on a scale of one to five, one being that you don't like to take risk at all. And five is that you're willing to take a lot of risk. How much risk do you want to take? Now, people say five because they think risk equals return. Mm -hmm. And it's all of these questions to get you to part with your money and taking a bunch of risks so that when you lose, they're like, well, you said you want to take a lot of risk. Now, imagine I ask you this question. Sounds like a painful survey. (laughs) Yeah, imagine I ask you those questions Mm -hmm. the day after you lost everything you had. Mm -hmm. What do you want to do? The number is going to be much smaller. Right. And you want to punch me in the face yeah. because you're like, karate chop you in the throat. You're like, I was willing to take these high numbers because I thought I was going to make a ton of money. Yeah. We're looking at risk management, risk mitigation, instead of risk tolerance. People don't have risk tolerance. They have loss tolerance. How much do you want to lose? Don't lose money. That's Mm -hmm. just not, you know, that's not a good idea. So wealthfactory.com forward slash scorecard gives people 10 questions to see how aligned an investment is with their investor DNA. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a cool, you know, resource. Yes, for one. Mm Mm-hmm. That's All a good right. one. Let's see what else we got here. Um, I think that there's good courses to take and to be an apprentice. So I was an apprentice once. I don't know whether it was official or not, but I was in this investments course where the professor had donated a quarter of a million dollars to the to the class. I mean, he bet, he managed $5 billion in municipal bond funds before he became a professor. And he said that he wanted to get in better shape. So I said, well, great. I'd be happy to work out with you. And we played racquetball and lifted weights. And so... What ended up happening is we'd go and have lunch afterwards or dinner or yogurt or whatever it was. And I just ask him questions. So I got to learn a massive amount because I stepped up and at a young age was just willing to like say, hey, I'll add value to your life since you want to work out more. And then I was able to kind of ask questions. And so learn from people who've done great things. I think that's a big part of it and be willing to add value to their life, be willing to work for them for free, even for a time just to learn from them, which we had, you know, think about Callahan, right. Who came and worked with this one summer. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think he got paid a few bucks here and there because, uh, <laughs> but most of the time it was just him wanting to learn. to learn. Yeah. And he said it was a 14 out of 10 apprenticeship. Wow. And for those of you that know his uh, famous brother who wrote never lose a customer again, Joey, he said that when he worked for Joey, it wasn't nearly as good. So just, just, <laughs> uh, you know, just saying that. So, and that what, didn't cost you anything. That relationship didn't cost you anything. It, it, Other it than added your time, value to my, right? to my life because mm-hmm. he was always willing to do stuff and yeah. learn and take notes and, you know, help out. So, right. It's not like you had to pay a couple thousand dollars to no. have a mentor. And, 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 and the other thing is when I was in college, I, there was actually a program called leap L E A P. It's a, kind of a life insurance selling program, lifetime economic acceleration program. It stood for, 
but I went and got licensed for the software and licensed in the education, which meant I had VHS tapes that I watched. I went to classes. I spent, you know, I think it was $4,900 or $5,500 on it, which was basically everything I'd saved up until that point, which was a fraction of what college would have cost. But it gave me so much knowledge and I built so many relationships and I really immersed myself in that. So Mm -hmm. find something that you can really learn from and be willing to invest in that to expose that skill set, to develop that skill set, you know. And for me, that was one of them. I also went to this thing called the Taggart Symposium. Mm -hmm. So that at the Taggart Symposium, there's this guy, Greg Barrick, and he was teaching charitable remainder trusts. I just went to the class and I read an article that he wrote. And then when I had a complicated situation with a client that wanted to sell their business, wanted to minimize their taxes, and I was saying, well, you should try a charitable trust. And his attorney made me feel like I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. So I just reached out to Greg Barrick, said, I heard you speak. I read your article. Here's the situation. And then Greg and I became friends and he helped my client out who didn't have to pay tax on the sale of his business. So I was right, but only like academically, I didn't know how to apply it. So I found the right people for that. Mm -hmm. But see, like attending things makes a huge difference because you can talk to people, you can ask some questions, you can, you know, you can see, put their best foot forward when they give some of these talks and hell, maybe right now that's all virtual, but uh, Mm -hmm. I think that hopefully we'll still be done, get, get back to a place. So I also found that like just interviewing authors and getting to know authors. And yeah, as an author, maybe it seems like it's easy for me, but let's use Drew who works with us, right? He, he's just one that was the first to like something or comment on something or promote us and, you know, got introduced and like simply became an advocate. And I think that, you know, everyone that's putting content out there or that's, you know, an expert in the area that you're trying to learn there's ways that you could be of value to them, whether you write them a check or not. And I think that the only thing is most people just aren't willing to reach out or make that comment or add value or that, you know, they say the phrase, which I don't love, like, I want to pick your brain. Nobody <laughs> wants their brain picked. You want to <laughs> add value to their life. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think way back when, um, you know, I had a teacher, Terry Tubbs, that helped me out with an entrepreneurship competition. Then my mom worked with the woman, Patty Rigby, that turned around and helped me learn how to do balance statements and income statements for this, you know, balance sheets and income statements. Like there's so many people willing to help that are willing to give, but most people just don't know how to ask for support, aren't willing to take that support. So I like this question because mm-hmm. this is how you become a better investor is you spend time with people who are great at those types of things. I mean, I've spoken at real estate programs that they're always looking for apprentices. And sometimes that means doing the grunt work and the dirt, but you get to learn from brilliant minds doing those types of things. Mm-hmm. I think one thing that I've heard you say on a couple of occasions is have three to five things tucked in the back of your mind mm-hmm. that when someone says, Hey, what can I do from you or for you? How can I support you? You already have items that you, you can ask for. I know I've been in the situation where people have asked me those questions and I'm like, Hmm, uh, yeah, I can't really think anything, anything. Let me get back to you. And then I never get back to them because life happens and I feel like I missed the opportunity. And so I think that's one thing that I've heard you say that would apply to this situation is, um, to have Gary, like really look at, Hey, these are three to five major things that I could really use some support on. Right. And so it can be a reciprocal relationship. I love it. Let's talk about how do you find these companies? Okay. Um, or, or the big, let's go with the biggest mistakes are actually intertwined. Okay. The thing is, is that nine out of 10 people that start looking for a business to buy are never actually going to pull the trigger on anything. Okay. It's, it's a crazy statistic. It's, it, it parallels that of startups. Right. And I think it has mostly to do with mindset. In other words, um, you know, if you are an investor and you're looking at, you know, a startup business and they sort of come out and pitch you, right? It's like, here's my slides. Here's why you should invest in me. Here's why you should give me, you know, your money. And a lot of that kind of transfers to, and, and when you're making, you know, stock picks or anything like that, it's this sort of like, sell me on the opportunity and then I'll spend my money. A lot of times, first time buyers have the same kind of mentality when they go out looking for a business. They sort of sit back, put their feet up on the desk and they're like, all right, why should I buy your company, right? And, and the concept is actually reversed, right? You need, to inter- you need to pretend it's an interview that you are the CEO of, you're interviewing for the CEO job, okay? Like uh, oh, someone who, who grew their business from scratch, it's their baby, it probably put their kids through college or you know, has basically been, it's the biggest asset that they own they don't like the money needs to make sense, but they're going to make a decision on all of the qualitative things that come along. Okay. So the first is sell yourself. Don't look to be sold. Okay. Uh, number two is work with a sense of urgency. A lot of people are like, Hey, 
you know, I, like this will happen when it happens. I'm looking for that, you know, gold nugget or whatever. And they're not working with a sense of urgency. And if you set a goal for yourself of like, hey, I'm going to buy a business in the, sec- in the next six months, that's really aggressive. That means like you need to find that company in the next 90 days and you need to start the closing process, okay? And if you're working with that sense of urgency, you will find your opportunity. You won't sit around and wait for, you know, that absolute perfect marriage, right? Like, like when, we're, when we're all like, like children, we think there's like one person out there for us, right? By the time we're 40, we realize, eh, I mean, you know, there's there's, there's wow. probably a couple dozen wow. people that were your, your poor wife, dude. I mean, <laughs> I'm a premier romantic and a hopeless romantic. And so I believe, you know, I met the one person that could tolerate my BS and still love me somehow. <laughs> That's true for you, but for most people, right? Like it's sort of a life decision that happens at a certain time. You're, you're yeah, a little, you know, yeah, okay. you're yeah, a little 1%. There are 8 million people out there, so yeah. And so the thing is, is, is there's a lot of relationships that could work, right? There's a lot of businesses that make a lot of sense, right? And the thing is, is like understanding the, the underlying drivers that are important to you and the growth opportunity that is right for you and what you bring to the business is the little thing that makes the big difference, okay? In other words, most people will look at a business opportunity at, or an acquisition opportunity as sort of like what's on the menu, right? And you and start great looking, business, other people are probably going to buy for it. So that's... It. Take treating like an interview, like bringing the best you have to the table, critical. They go, they go into the restaurant not knowing if they want chicken or steak or pasta or if they're a vegetarian or they don't even know what they're looking for, right? So finding out what it is that you bring to the table as a CEO is the thing that's going to help you identify what's the right business for you. And okay. what, what kind of things for people that have never owned a business before hmm. would they need to prepare for? What, like... How complicated in your mind is it for someone who's never owned a business to run a business? Like, is there things that you would do if you had never owned a business to do this right? Were there resources that you would read or people that you would seek out? Yeah. I mean, saying you're going to buy a business is sort of like, like saying, I'm going to go get a job. Like, like there's so many different types of companies that it's impossible to answer the question. What I would say is, is that, you know, I, I make money a few different ways. One of the things I do is I work as a business broker for online businesses. And I think that online businesses have a a high degree of transferability. So they're easy to buy and they're easy to sell. And it's also kind of like business light. In other words, they they tend to not have like, you know, 35 employees, you know, at, at, at a manufacturing location with all kinds of capital equipment and things that can go wrong. And so the more people you add and the more, the more uh, pieces of equipment you add, the more increased complexity there is, right? And so there's kind of like, there, there's just kind of like, like, you know, let, let, me, let me answer the question this way. Search funds have become very popular in MBA programs, right? It's the number one, like entrepreneurship through acquisition is the number one elective MBA class at every single school in which it's taught. But it's only taught at 11 schools, okay? And the concept is search funds. So like, you know, MBA students basically getting financed by these, you know, institutional capital firms or, or angel investors to go out and find a business and buy it and run it. Okay. And the thing is, is, it, you know, I've often questioned, you know, is that a good idea for like a newly minted MBA to run out and buy a company? Right. And the thing is, is that I thought I was ready when, when I graduated with my MBA, what happened was, you know, it, it was, I found the private markets, they're opaque, they're fragmented. It takes a while to figure it out. And so I spent a couple of years looking, but during that time I had a couple of jobs. And Garrett, I just want to tell you, I learned more, like just in my mid twenties, like out there doing it, like actually trying to sell things, actually trying to, you know, manage teams of people, actually trying to, you know, run production that like, I got to actually like break things on other people's dimes before I ran out and bought a business. So, so working for the type of business, business, working for the type of business that you might look to, you know, acquire. So going back to your menu analogy, chicken, steak, vegetarian, like once you identify this is what I'm going to acquire, yep. then you uncover your investor DNA, like how you understand how you would run that, how learn from those people, even if you're paid less than what you want, be paid with that education, be paid with that information, be paid with that insight. And then, you know, especially if you were going to work for somewhere that wanted to sell in three years, go That's ahead right. and put yourself right into that purchase. That's right. So, so I think like, Understanding what you bring to the table, working with a sense of urgency, 
and really understanding that you know you're applying to be the CEO of this company are sort of like the three things that that make the big difference in in initiating a search and actually closing on something. Yeah. So so the mistake would be not knowing what you're looking for. Yep. Going into it before you're ready. Mm -hmm. um, not knowing what would make you ready or who to learn from. Yep. Um, and then you know just. Uh, not knowing where to search would be another mistake. Jumping into something too early would be another mistake. Uh, so, you know, trying to do too much alone. Yeah, can, let me let me put let me like so. So when you get into like like I would say once that once you actually get to LOI like what letter of intent and you can put in an offer that's accepted, the mistakes that happen after that are, you know, it's sort of like do your due diligence. It's it's kind of amazing to me how many people are sort of laissez faire about their diligence and what that means is is it we're already bought into the idea before we've done the analysis. Like I, I already know I'm gonna buy it, so I stop looking at due diligence because I'm convinced. That's it. And and, and I'm just speaking from my experience of acquiring a business. Just saying Yeah. No, that, yeah. yeah. That's it. And, and 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 the thing is is that like this is how it actually surfaces. Uh, the day before closing or the week before closing, it's like, yeah, I don't know. I just have cold feet. Like, I just feel like I can't close it for some reason. I don't know. I'm not comfortable. Well, you're not comfortable because you didn't do your diligence, right? <laughs> like, if you actually jump in and do financial and legal and operational diligence, you're going to be very comfortable. Now, there's always a leap of faith. It's always a little nerve wracking, you know, when you're taking out a big loan to buy something that, like, its destiny is is dependent on on your ability to actually create the future you're after, but the, but the thing is, is like, do your diligence and just prep, right? And, and the only other thing that I would say is, it's not exactly a mistake, but, but it, it leads to one, which is a lot of first time buyers really don't understand that most sellers don't, like are not evil by nature. In other words, they think that they're trying to dodge some kind of bullet or like, oh, if it's so good, how come they're selling, right? And the thing is, is that like, you know, probably a, a percentage of people are bad people, okay? That leaves 99%, okay? When you go to sell a business, it's a natural part of the life cycle of entrepreneurship, okay? Like, number one, you know, we build something of value, okay? And, and, and it's a value. And then, you know, we, we, get, we get it to a certain point doing what we know what to do. And, and then it sort of starts to flatten out. And as entrepreneurs, we all kind of have shiny object syndrome to some degree, and so you get sort of on to the next thing and like you start, you know, planting seeds and then you're like, wait a minute, I can do this. But what I really need to do is sell this company first so that I can focus on the next thing. Right. And so you've created something of value and it's time to sell, right? It's time to exit. It's time to sell it to someone to take it to the next level. At the same time, if you look at that growth from like zero to one, if you will, when you're starting a business from scratch and compare it to, you know, buying a company with, if you use a lot of leverage, you use a lot of leverage, put a small down payment in the curve is very parallel, right? Like you're building that equity in the company almost at the same rate, especially if you can grow it, right? And so it's, it's just a part of the natural life cycle. And then once you have run your course, it's time for you to sell as well. So yeah, and that's part of the acquisition entrepreneurship goldmine is if you have new insight, new energy, new, you know, a new person, there's definitely some break off in that, but there's also po 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 a possibility for breakthrough for, bringing yep. that, you know, energy to it. So where do people find businesses? Like, you know, you're a business broker. Like I, I pretty much just tell people business brokers. I mean, do you have a better answer than that? No, I, I think that's the best place to go, frankly. I like, look, there, there's a lot of attention. Once you, once you break into like, okay, what is acquisition entrepreneurship and how do I do it? You'll see there's a lot of noise around proprietary deal flow. Ooh, what that means is go out and talk to everyone, you know, okay. And, and try, you know, try to, try to dig up a, a, a deal, okay? The thing is, 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 look, I spent a lot of time trying to do that myself. Off-market off deals happen all the time, okay? It happens. But uh, number one, um, every, every business owner who hasn't sold, who hasn't talked to a business broker yet or gotten evaluation or, you know, business broker, by the way, can be called intermediary, investment banker, M&A advisor, it doesn't matter, okay? If they haven't talked to someone and sort of gotten evaluation and understand the process, everyone knows that their business is worth like 20 times EBITDA. Okay. And you know, that's not how the private markets work, but the first EBITDA, thing <laughs> you know, those that haven't heard the term, you hear it a lot, especially in this type of, you know, transaction, it's earnings before interest and depreciation and amortization, right? Uh, amortization. Mm -hmm. So basically it's looking at a 
more clear picture of what the profitability or revenue is after certain expenses are taken out or certain, you know, things have, have minimized. So, yeah. Indeed. It's an attempt to neutralize earnings independent of management decisions. Like, like, like if this business is a box, like how much cash does the box generate that I can use? Right? Like that's, that's the concept. So, so 20 times EBITDA um, would be okay for a publicly traded firm with, you know, a billion in revenue yeah. or, you know, a million dollar business, you're probably looking somewhere between, you know, 2.5 times and four times, right. Depending yeah. on well, number 10 to 20% of what they're, you know, yeah. About. yeah. Yeah. So, um, Another reason why I'm excited for small businesses because I'd rather do two and a half than 20. You know, like if I'm buying a small piece of a publicly traded company because I own a share, well, I'm buying that and I'm basically saying it's worth 20 times more than what I'm paying for it essentially, right? That's its like a future potential and yeah. where it's going to go to. Or if I'm buying this other business, I'm like, I'm buying it today for two and a half times what the EBITDA is, which is different than even revenue. And so it's just a, there's a lot more upside potential or immediate cash flow, which most stocks don't produce a lot of cash flow, but a private business could. I've interviewed some of your clients and, you know, that made it profitable after 30 days. And there was, had a really good stream of cash flow after 90 days or 180 days. So and part of it is they had expertise in that arena and they focused on some things that the other owner just didn't know about because a lot of these entrepreneurs are good with ideas and starting something, not good with managing it and, and the details behind it. So, you know, if you're, and what I find is a lot of people that aren't business owners are very detail oriented. They usually work in an organization rather than start something. So, you know, in the Myers-Briggs world, like an SJ, like a methodical, less likely to start a business, but maybe the perfect candidate to buy a business and improve everything in that business. Right. Mm -hmm. So just as an idea there. Mm -hmm. You know, like yes, this morning I was talking with um, one of the members of the acquisition lab that I run and it's, she was asking about, we were talking about, you know, um, uh, the book traction, uh, uh, um, yep. you know, Wickman, right. Yep. And Gina Wickman as the visionary integrator, uh, dynamic. And what I want to tell you is I read that while I was CEO of a book printing company. Okay. And I was like, I don't need to, like, I'm the visionary and the, and the integrator. Like, like, I don't, like, I don't have, I don't have, I can't afford a visionary walking around, you know, you know, you know, and I, and I also can't afford to like leave the business and just walk around being the visionary. Right. So I had to be bold. And so what I came up with before I read the book was actually revenue generator or profit maximizer. Okay. And, and, and I feel like if you're, in not a high growth business or you're in more of a mature business or something like that, I feel like you kind of resonate in one of the two places. And then along the way, I've sort of realized that like in high growth companies, the visionary integrator roles really make a lot of sense. And so I came up with this idea that they actually overlap with each other and you end up with like quadrants, right? And it's sort of like, what, you know, where do you fall and like, what's the right business opportunity for you? So to your point, uh, you know, there's, there's a ton of people out there that just want to manage a going concern. And, you know, if you take this sort of like, you know, 3x, you know, multiple of, of EBITDA kind of, of earnings of, of valuation that we're talking about, Garrett, what you're talking about is, you know, putting 10% down on a business, getting a 90% loan on the business, and then off of the price, you're making a 30% return, okay? And then you cut that in half if you maximize like the, the loan, right? So you're still, I mean, you're still making like 15% on your money right away. Now, the argument against that is like, yeah, Walker, that's great, but I'm putting my time in, right? And so I should be making a salary as well. Yeah, you are, right? I mean, this is your salary, but the point is, is you also get the asset. So you're, you're, you're working your, your cash flow statement, you're working your, your personal income statement, and you're working your balance sheet simultaneously. Yeah, you have more control over the outcome of your income. You have more influence. And I think this notion of passive investing, where we just give people our money and then money comes in every month, is a faulty notion that the reality is the more active we are up front to buy an asset that can continue to generate revenue, the more passive it becomes over time versus just watching our money pass us by. And this is the travesty for humanity is that we've been you know, taught, trained and educated, hand your money over, wait for 30 years and it's all going to work out. Well, 95% of the time it does not work out. So I like this because you can look at the predictability of the business, the financials, how long it's been around. And, you know, 
I, I'm thinking of two people that weren't business owners that read your book and bought businesses and they're doing great. It doesn't mean there isn't trouble at times and they don't have to get involved and there isn't like, yes, it requires effort. When we think there's something for nothing, we're being robbed of our livelihood. It doesn't exist. There isn't mailbox money for 99% of the people or 99% of the time. Even if you're part of the Lucky Sperm Club, meaning you were born into the family, you still got to behave a certain way if you want to still get it. If you're going to win the lottery, you're one in however many people that actually win it. The rest of the suckers are just giving their money away. And if you marry into it, that's probably the hardest work there ever has been to be able to get money because now you got to fake that you love someone and that's a pretty tough <laughs> thing to do. So I look at this as a much better alternative here, right? So, so Walker, thanks for answering those questions. I got to have you back on to ask the millionaires because we did get more questions around this. But I will say I don't endorse a lot of books because first off, I only endorse books that I read. And what most authors do is say, hey, I want you to endorse my book. Can you have it to me by Thursday? And it's Tuesday. And I'm like, well, I can. But you actually got me the book, got it to me on time. I read every page of the book, and I personally wrote the endorsement. Now, I don't know if you massaged it or made it better, but I did write the endorsement that went into the book. And then I endorsed it so much that I bought a bunch of copies. We handed it out to clients, and I consistently introduced Walker to people and connect them into to my team because this is an important part of our future when it comes to investing. And a lot of the financial people out there don't get paid on a transaction for you to buy a private business, including my firm. We're not paid on that. I don't care. I'm here to make sure we're doing the right things so that people can get ahead because there's going to be a major transfer of wealth. And this is one of the three avenues that that transfer happens. Make sure you're on the right side of that transfer. You can help out your employees. You can help out you know, the people that are your customers rather than just watch your money dissipate when you're in an overinflated stock market that has no accountability. So, um, Walker, any final words before I bring you back on and interview you again? I would just say that this is entrepreneurship. It's not easy. To your point, it's active investing, okay? So you can be active and uninvested, like at your job, or you can be invested and passive and enjoy your $1 a month return <laughs> or you can combine them together and you know create something that is truly special and built around right now is not the time for cash flow banking um for his situation so and why that's is that because he's unemployed with a small amount of money and that's mm -hmm. more of a place to store your income mm -hmm. and and start saving a percentage now is a dangerous time in real estate it's not a bad time mm -hmm. it's just a dangerous time so if you get started in a time where things are massively appreciating, it covers up some of your mistakes. Yeah. When we're dealing with a lot of the uncertainty because who knows what's gonna happen with lenders, are they gonna tighten up lending because of defaults? Um, you know, it just means, okay, well, if you make a mistake, it might really hurt, mm -hmm. right? Now there's plenty that you can do even if you don't have good credit or even if you don't have income coming in. There's things like lease options that you're not getting bank financing for or, or subject to, or you might just be taking over someone's payment, you know, but you got to make sure that it could be cash flow positive if you don't have income coming in. So that can also be dangerous. Um, but since right now he's got more time than money, mm -hmm. see people that have a lot of money, but less time, they can hire people directly. Right. right, they could build a team. They could hire a mentor that works with them to get really succinct information that directly applies to what they're looking mm -hmm. for. But when you've got more time, then it's really about creating a schedule that you act as if you're employed as a real estate investor. And so there's plenty of programs that are very inexpensive. I mean, maybe even as cheap as 97 bucks that have plenty of great content. Mm -hmm. It's just that a lot of people won't go through the content. So they're willing to pay a lot more money just to get that one on one attention. Mm -hmm. So I would take a small portion of that to invest in real estate education. But it's really about picking a lane. Do you want to do fix and flips? That's, you know, finding a property that's maybe needs a little bit of a sweat equity that you, you know, if you have some skills, I don't really have those skills, but let's say people have skills where they go fix that up on their own and turn around and sell it. It is a competitive market that way. Or maybe you're looking at single family residences or duplexes or fourplexes, right? And you're looking to get that and rent that out and be cash flow positive. But you and I know someone by the name of Brian Page. Yes. He has a pretty fascinating system where he's basically teaching people that without any money, they can go and lease a place, right? And even partner with the person that owns the property 
and then they Airbnb that property. Mm -hmm. Now there's certain places in the country where that is absolutely not going to work right now because of COVID. Mm -hmm. There's other places where it works extraordinarily well. I just did an article in Forbes where there was these two real estate investors that I was interviewing and they're three hours north of Manhattan and they're just totally booked out with their Airbnbs because people wanted to get out of the city during COVID and not be, you know, just trapped in their small apartments. And so that was a great thing for them because they're in the right area. Mm -hmm. So you really have to understand the area that you're going to get into. But Brian was able to have no money. He just had a roommate that left and he's like, all right, I'll run out this room. Started making that not only pay for his rent, he actually made a positive return. So he started going out to other landlords, you know, and saying, hey, I'd like to partner with you. I'll make sure that you're paid the amount that you need just to cover what you would normally lease this out for. But mm -hmm. then we can actually share in a percentage of the gains above that. So no money. It just required the time. Mm -hmm. Then eventually he started to hire people to help him manage it so that he could travel. I don't even know to like, I don't know how many different countries and places that he was traveling at one time because he had this freedom by building that infrastructure. My co-author, Nick Halleck, who, you know, mm -hmm. with five day weekend does much of the same thing where he's got all these properties, but he's a gypsy. He's all over the place and he just manages it from his phone because he has a team that's kind of that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily take money to make money. It takes value creation. It takes resourcefulness and the hidden capital that people have is their mental capital and relationship capital, mm -hmm. which I'll have you define. Oh my, oh my, okay. I'm so just throwing you <laughs> on the spot here in the hundredth episode. I guess I can call myself a money nerd now if I'm answering right, some see. questions. Let's see. So relationship capital, that one feels the most obvious, right? It's the people in your life that you can tap into, create synergy with, um, to create something new together. Absolutely. People, the, networks, organizations, friends, family, mentors, tenants, if we're talking real estate, right? Yes. Yeah. And mental capital is everything that you know, your your skill and your expertise. That doesn't right. mean, I think sometimes when we think mental capital, um, we have to be like the best of the best, but you don't. Everybody has knowledge that they can share with people within their pool in their community. So everybody has it. Everybody has something to share. Right. So when you can tap into developing mental capital to become a better real estate investor, mm -hmm. that's going to give you an advantage versus people who might just be getting it because like, like when I first got involved in real estate, I didn't have a lot of discernment. I just was like, Oh, that's a deal. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. And I got lucky a few times. And then I realized that it was more about luck than intelligence and mm -hmm. other times. So I would pick a lane. Like, what is it that you want to learn about real estate? Where do you want to dive in and try to get as much mental capital and expertise around that? Mm -hmm. And then who do you know that you could learn from or partner with? Maybe they've got good credit, but they've got less time. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of deals that way early on where I was like, well, I've got the money. They've got the expertise. Yeah. Those are a little bit dangerous because if that person with the expertise walks away, you now have a property and you've got to figure out the expertise. Yeah. But I absolutely think that you can do these things because other people might have good credit if you don't, other mm -hmm. people might have money if you don't, mm -hmm. but what you've got to bring to the table is unique mental capital. Yeah. Why would that real estate property be profitable? What is it that you see that someone else doesn't see? Brian Page had mental capital that was extraordinarily unique where yeah. he's able to come in and go, well, look, we can partner. I mm -hmm. can make you more money than what you'd normally get just by getting a single tenant. And so that added a lot of value. And we've mm -hmm. seen that happen with a lot of our wealth factory clients where they had real estate that was maybe negative cash flow or it wasn't working out. And they started to employ an Airbnb strategy mm -hmm. and start get positive cash flow on their properties because yeah. it's more active because you have more, you know, you have someone coming in for a weekend or for a week and then you got to, you know, you rent it back out and you know, you're, you're dealing with that. So yeah, it's more active, but it's also providing more value. It's also providing more cash. Mm -hmm. And so this is the way I would kind of look at it. Yeah. I would say that's a great example of collaboration. Mm -hmm. You know, finding ways to collaborate with people is essential. Absolutely. So I'm just, I'm just looking at some of the notes that we took here. Uh, you know, but the, the key here is invest in education, mm -hmm. and invest in relationships. I mean, are the relationships that they're doing really well and they could use someone that's got time on their hands. Yeah. Right. And that you could add that value, learn from them. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you're just learning from them and not profiting on a property, but you're seeing how they do it, how they structure it, how they find it, find those types of people mm -hmm. and add value to their life, make deposits in that relationship capital mm -hmm. with your time with, and then, and in exchange, learn from them. Mm -hmm. Like that's an absolutely huge way. That's what I did when uh, Stephen Harrop was my professor, but he knew a lot about money management, one of the top money managers in the world before he became a professor. So mm -hmm. I played racquetball with him, I worked out with him, and then I got to sit down with him and have lunch or a ice cream afterwards. 
which is why you work out so you could have the <laughs> ice cream afterwards, Tolva. And I got to ask him questions. I got to learn from him, right? So I wasn't paying him directly. I was finding out what was valuable to him, which he wanted to get in better shape. I knew something about that. So I just brought my unique mental capital to the table and built that relationship. Mm -hmm. People are underutilizing relationship capital. It's the most valuable yet underutilized asset. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to ask for support. They're afraid to ask for help. They're, you know, and it's not a, hey, can I pick your brain? Because that's yeah. too one-sided. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, what what are you looking for? What what are you valuing? And you know, I think everything's within reach or referral with mental or relationship capital. Yeah, I love that line. It goes, what you're talking about goes beyond the standard or the traditional view of networking. It's not just swapping a business card with someone. It's not saying, hey, can I take you to coffee and pick your brain? It's more in depth, it's more reciprocal yep. and um, finding creative ways to engage with people that offer mutual value is, right. you know, is obviously a We're win. one idea or one relationship away from the next level of prosperity. Mm -hmm. So create a habit on a daily yes, say basis. Say that again. I think we need to hear that more than once. <laughs> one relationship or one idea yeah. away from the next level of prosperity. Yep. But what is the game that you want to play in real estate? Mm -hmm. Why does real estate interest you? What type of real estate interests you? Mm -hmm. What ways could you create cash flow? What value could you bring to the table that isn't already being brought to the table? Mm -hmm. What's the thing that you could dive in so deep that you really understand it at a very deep level? I spread myself thin in real estate early on. I had, you know, properties that were single family, then I had duplex, then I did some commercial, I just did too much without getting expertise in just one mm -hmm. and dialing that in. The only thing that I really do now is lease options, properties that I own, that I turn around and I gave to investors that they make the payment, they manage the property, but I'm basically the bank for them. Mm -hmm. And then if they sell it, they get the appreciation because they're the, they cared for it, but maybe they didn't have the credit, but they were willing to go in and fix the properties because they had deferred maintenance. They're willing to yeah. work with the tenants. So it's, I get a little bit of cash flow. They get the majority of it and they get the appreciation. But what it does is it prevents me from having to spend too much time in real estate. So mm -hmm. that's been my kind of method at this point. Yeah. You know, it's finding your niche. Like in business, we talk about what's your avatar, what's your audience. But when you're looking at your investor DNA, it's like really hone in and find your niche, like get down to the nitty gritty details of what it is that you want to learn and invest your time in. Yep. So how do you create mental capital mm -hmm. and how do you, you know, how do you multiply that? For me, I multiply it by meeting people and getting those direct conversations. I add to it by listening to things or reading things. So you find your multipliers there. Mm -hmm. And then in those relationships, just find the ones that are going to be the most meaningful and invest more time in them, mm -hmm. invest more time in them and the ones that are willing to invest back into you. I mean, I'm doing that right now. I have a speech coming up because when I was a, a teenager, I was in a program called Governor's Honors Academy, mm -hmm. right? Where I got to meet so many fascinating people, inventors and scientists and senators, and it expanded my mind. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going back for, I don't know, I think this is my third time to give a speech and to kind of pay it forward. So I think that there's people willing to do that out there. You just mm -hmm. have to look for it and be willing to ask questions. I think that there's such an access to information if you have good questions mm -hmm. and if you are willing to learn. A lot of people love to pay that forward. They love to see someone that's curious. They love to see someone that's mm -hmm. willing to go out there and do it. And a lot, you know, I uh, did this interview um, just the other day with Clayton Morris and, and yeah. he was on an air, a flight to New Zealand and in the last hour started talking to someone sitting next to him who is a great real estate investor. Clayton was only going to be there for five days. This person was going to be there for two months. He's like, how do you do that? I got to go back to my job. He goes, well, I'm a real estate investor. And he just gave him the equations. What does he do? How does he look for the properties? What are the, you know, mm -hmm. and then Clayton was able to go invest in real estate and then replace that salaried income. Mm -hmm. He just found that one niche in real estate. So yeah. don't try to learn it all. Maybe take a sampling to say, what is it that really interests me? What really intrigues mm -hmm. me? What am I willing to dedicate substantial time and really mm -hmm. dive into? And that's the key focus. Don't diversify. Yeah, that's a good reminder. Where should you store your cash if you aren't ready to invest it or it's supposed to be used for your six months of savings? Is there something better than like a checking savings or money market account with interest rates so low and the measly amount that's earned actually being taxable? There has to be a better way. Good news. There is. What's the proper mix of paying off loans versus setting money aside to have liquidity, staying power, and a peace of mind fund? If these are questions you'd like an answer to, you're in the right place. Unfortunately, most people don't have enough savings, so I'll illustrate ways to find money to build up this account as well. There are structures that support your success, plus ways to find money that's rightfully yours, but it's just slipping through your fingers. Now, not all your money should be in the bank, and there's a way to boost your savings 400 to 800% without tax. 
while still being able to access the money without locking away until 59 and a half. Let's get to it. Stoba, what's up? You ready to rock yeah, and roll? I am. You? I am. You know, one thing I was thinking about with all of this COVID kind of unique stuff going on, there's good stuff coming out of it. Like, what's one thing that you just feel like, oh, this my life is better because I have... I'm in my cabin more often. Hey, I love that. The skies seem a little bluer. Mm-hmm. I'm trying, there's a lot for me. You don't me. have to see I, me as often. <laughs> no, I actually see you quite a bit. <laughs> you know, I just, I think for me, I, I spend a lot of time just kind of meditating in quiet, but this has been different for me just to be able to like have some time to create, like get back into my watercolors since I'm not dancing and doing my other creative expression activities. So it's been kind of nice just to. It's almost like on a rainy day where you have permission to stay in and read a book and do what you want. You don't feel like you always have to be doing something. It's 40 some days of rainy days where we have You've permission to do what we more. want. I've been watching more movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> read. I have, well, I have this long list of books that I've always, that I just, I always add to it. And I'm like, I just need to start reading more. So you I've been read picking up the books. Cows. Who's that? Who wrote that book? No. All right. <laughs> okay. What's our question? Okay. Let's dive in. It's from Paul. Mm -hmm. He says, I've been watching your YouTube channel and I'm loving it. Nice. I'm curious what Garrett determines as having liquidity cash. How can I have cash to invest? Would that be a savings type account? You can pull funds from tax free whenever needed. I'm going to stop investing in the stock market and pay down more consumer debt, but also want to build up my emergency and savings mm -hmm. fund. What is the best account to put money into? A savings, a TFSA, a high interest savings. I look forward to hearing from you. Keep putting out amazing content. Thanks, Paul. All right, let's find some money first, Paul. Um, refinancing something we talk about all the time to get better interest rates. But there's also the four I's, which is if you can get money back from the IRS, which there's three new IRS notices that have come out with like the CARES Act and everything. So there's a way that people can kind of go back and a lot of times get some money back and get uh, rebates. The second I is interest. Yeah, restructuring loans, refi you know that refinance that I'm talking about, renegotiating interest rates. The third I is investments. Do you have any non-performing fees or retirement fund costs that aren't actually helping you out? And then the fourth one is insurance. So that's part of it. But there's also these CARES Acts and things like that that are out there. So um, if you're a business owner and, and small businesses can apply for this through the Payment Protection Program and the Emergency Injury Disaster Loans. And so if you haven't done that, that makes some sense. You go to you know missingmoney.com if there's any money that's rightfully yours, but it ended up in state property because it didn't get to the right address for you. You can kind of reclaim that. And part of our liquidity and savings, it's nice to have a little bit of money in a safe at home. If there's ever, uh, you know, an emergency or natural disaster, like we've had earthquakes where we live, yeah. um, it's nice so to have some cash on hand, right? Um, so that's important. Even some precious metals that might be stored in that safe. And I like to have a little bit of money at the bank, but be careful which banks you're at. I think the most, the more major banks right now are probably the safer place to be. The household names, the big, big banks that finance so much of what's important. We know the government's likely to bail them out before they might help out a regional bank. So that's something to consider. But having you know a little bit of cash in the safe, having a little bit of precious metals, maybe like one month's expenses, and a, you know a couple like a couple months that are at a bank. Beyond that, there's a philosophy of cash flow banking. So cash flow banking, and some people get really up in arms when I talk about this because let's mm -hmm. face it, most people haven't designed their insurance policies properly. And as soon as we hear the word insurance, it's like, well, that's different. Well, look. I'm talking about cash value insurance in straight whole life policies that are overfunded. Mm -hmm. So you put as much as you can based upon what the government will allow while still maintaining all your tax advantages. And then that money is available to you. Now, the downside is that first year you're going to have less than if you kept it in a savings account, probably even the same for the second year. But then after that, you're going to see more momentum building where more is showing up than what you're putting in. And it's available to you without taxation with a minimum guaranteed so interest rate, like 4% mm -hmm. with the right types of companies. Once the dividend's paid, it's yours forever. It's FIFO, meaning the first dollars you put in are the first dollars you can take back without tax. There's borrowing provisions, which allow you to take whatever's in there and borrow the insurance company's money while your money's still earning interest. They charge you interest. You can pay it back on your own discretion or subtract it from the death benefit while you die, when you die. And so ultimately you can avoid taxes altogether, get tax advantages moving forward, and even have the money protected from financial 
financial predators. In 40 plus states, it's fully protected from bankruptcy and liability, but in all states and even in uh, Canada, it's partially protected, right? So, is so that this up is to a certain amount or what do you mean by partially, partially protected? protected? There might be states where it says the first $25,000 of your cash value is fully protected, but okay. then above that, it doesn't have protection against it. Okay. That's certain states. Mm -hmm. Other states, it's 100% and fully protected. So okay. you just want to sign up for the policy in those types of states. Yeah. So if someone is wanting to get one of these policies, what's the, the minimum amount that they can start? Because I think sometimes when people hear this, they're like, I have to have a ton of money to be even begin. I start with these. 50 bucks a month. Okay. So now it's doable for a lot of people. Properly, mind mm -hmm. you, it was just the baseline policy. But then the second one I started was $262 a month, which I was overfunding. So it could build cash value a lot faster. And I've bought more and more as like my income's gone up and I've gotten older and things like that. So, you know, you can start mm -hmm. somewhere progress yeah. over perfection and yeah. start to build kind of your own system. Because look, the banks, when you put money in the bank, they take and put a portion of their reserves in cash value type policies. The thing is, they have the type of bank owned life policies that are heavy, heavy on the cash. They're designed really nice. Mm -hmm. For an individual, they have to kind of design it where it might not be incentivization to the person selling it because they're going to take a lot less commission. So mm -hmm. we endorse cashflowbanking.com and I've certified the people that kind of work over there that we know that they're doing the right things for the people and they're using the right types of companies and they're designing it properly. And we've got a lot of videos on YouTube on this type of a topic. So those are all things I'd take a look at. Okay. Now for someone starting out, maybe looking to get their first policy, just maybe a couple of things to, for them to look at, whether they're looking at the contract or having a conversation with the yeah. agent to know that the policy is well designed. We want to see first and foremost, the right company. 100 years old minimum, multi, 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 multi billions of dollars with that company. <laughs> a lot you, don't of zeros. Want a small, yeah. you don't want a small company, right? You want only A ratings with that company. Um, I prefer a mutual company over a stock company, meaning the policyholders own the company, not stockholders, so that if there are distributions, yeah. it just comes to policyholders. It's not split up with stockholders. Mm -hmm. And then um, PUA, paid up additions. This is the feature where you can put extra cash in it's going to go into the cash value with minimal or no commission against it. You can pull that money back out 30 days later, right? So you want to make sure it's flexible. Can you put some in and then put less in the next month if you have a, you know, or can you put in le less in one year versus the next year? Because each company has a little bit of a nuance that way. Yeah. And there's plenty of good companies out there, whether it's Northwestern Mutual, New York Life, mm -hmm. Guardian, One America, you know, even quasi emeritus, uh, you know, Penn Mutual, um, you know, there's there's a lot of companies out there that I think are good. But when I say a lot, less than 20, mm -hmm. even though there's hundreds or maybe thousands of insurance companies that offer insurance, the right type of policy is really critical. The right yeah. type of design is really critical. Mm -hmm. Cash heavy, less commission, you know, advance uh, your, your results quicker and then you have access to it. What you have to be careful with is there are upfront costs. There is a time where you're going to be behind just being in a savings or money market account. So yeah. I highly recommend having one month of your cash sitting in a safe, one month of your expenses in precious metals, one, maybe two months sitting in a bank right now. And then you can start transferring some of that money into cash value insurance plans mm -hmm. so that you can boost it long term. Yeah. So I guess when I have a question about the precious metals. So when you mm -hmm. when someone has that and they're safe, you know, let's just say things get crazy and they need to tap into the precious metals. What is a person going to do with that? Like, uh, I bet that's not the, like, there's a lot of people wondering, what do I, what am I going to do with these jewels in my safe? <laughs> you, Utah I mean, has gold, has gold as a currency. Uh -huh. So they've actually, you know, deemed it a, a currency just like mm -hmm. money would be. Um, I look at it more as like a hedge during times like this, where we're adding trillions of dollars into the economy. Yeah. Precious metals typically have a little bit more value and can kind of be that hedge. When people say, well, for the worst of times, you can use precious metals. Well, I guess that's your get out of Dodge fund where you're like getting on a ship to get the hell out. <laughs> right. um, but I think at that point, toilet paper is probably going to be more valuable. It seems to be valuable right now. Yeah, seriously. Um, or, com you know, batteries or food or that kind of stuff. So I'm not quite I'm not quite on that boat where like mm -hmm. that's the end all be all. Mm -hmm. Because if things were as bad as someone were to predict it, like the people that are thinking it's end of times, I don't know that gold yeah. and silver is really going to be all that valuable. Yeah. Yeah. I could see the importance of having it, but it just doesn't seem super practical for many yeah. people. All right. So look, we've helped you out with a couple things here. That's called cashflow banking, cashflowbanking.com. It's time to find money. 
watch our videos on the four I's, which are the ways to efficiency, or on the three R's, which are how you can like, restructure loans and use cash flow optimization. We talked about missingmoney.com to find out if you're owed money and it's sitting at the state. We t we just briefly touched on the CARES Act the, with the PPP and the EIDLs. If those are you know foreign language because you're not a business owner, don't worry about it. If you are a business owner, we've got long videos on that right here on the YouTube channel. Having money in a safe at home, having some precious metals, great, but cash flow banking is where you take it to the next level. I met with a business owner. He was worth $70 million at the time that I met with him. He had less than $1 million in his 401k, yet he was not sleeping at night and his business was starting to suffer because of the losses that he was getting inside of his 401k because the market was going down at the time. He'd taken a 10% hit. And I said, well, why do you put money in the 401k in the first place? He goes, I, well, that, that's what my financial advisor tells me to do. And I'm like, how do they get paid? Oh, fees on the 401k. That's all that they're going to tell you to do. I'm like, let's talk about the best investments that you've ever had in your life. Number one, he owned an Andy Warhol painting that he sold early because of lack of liquidity. I'm like, if you would have held on to it, how much more is it worth now? He said, three and a half times more. He was really good at buying wine. And I said, hey, if you make a mistake buying wine, you can drink it and you'll forget about the mistake. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good scenario there anyway. The third thing is he built, he built a home that Oprah featured on uh, when she used to have her you know, regular show before the Oprah Winfrey Network because of how smart of a home it was and how cool it was in St. Charles. And so I'm like, well, maybe those are better investments for you. And you know what? He abandoned funding a 401k. We used it to buy some land in Bali where he was gonna build a nice little spread that he could have out there. And he's in Bali right now. And that was a lot more confidence a lot more aligned with his investor DNA, stopped doing things that everyone else was telling him to do that even though it didn't feel like it was working for him, he felt guilty about and he was indoctrinated in this accumulation philosophy. And guess what? Now he's able to focus on his business and have his business grow. So investing, one of the biggest mistakes people make in investing is they invest in things that start to drain their energy or have them lose sleep. Because if you invest and it creates or elicits any degree of scarcity or fear, it's not a good investment for you regardless of the rate of return of the investment. Here's why. Your greatest return is your ability to generate a vision, to produce value within your business, and deliver value for your customers and clients and people you interact with. And if you start investing in something that derails you, distracts you, or harms you, then you're losing your biggest ability to produce, and that, uh, that's called opportunity cost. And most people can't recognize and calculate that, but I'm telling you, that is the biggest thing. And so this is all on lever four here, scale business revenue. The biggest way to do it, build a vision that's compelling enough that other people want to build it with you or for you, right? That's scale. And then finally, make it count. Make it count is about relaxation and rejuvenation. In my, in my 20s, I was a fairly competitive person. I wanted to be the you know, highest producing uh, financial guy and all the circles I was in. And if I heard anyone doing more than me, I immediately was depressed and hated myself and, you know, lowered my self-esteem and pissed off and all that kind of stuff because I didn't really have any measures of what success meant. It was just, I had more than anyone else. But guess what? There's always someone that has more than you. You know, who has more money, Warren Buffett or someone else? Well, the Rothschilds have more money than him. You know, I mean, there's always something you can find if you're in that comparison mindset. I think the best thing to compare to is where you came from more than everyone else, because then it's about progress over perfection. But in my 20s, people would always ask, oh, you live in Utah, do you ski? I'm like, no, I own a business. You know, they're like, what are your hobbies? I'm like, business? What do you do for fun? Business. It was pretty much the only answer that I had. I didn't understand this make it count thing, but I was in a program called Strategic Coach, and Dan Sullivan uh, was the founder, and Bab Smith was the president and ran it, and I became one of their top three referrers, so I got a lot of time and attention from them. And I remember Bab sitting down with me, and she's like, you know, I think you're great, but I think that if you don't take some time off, it's, you're really gonna suffer, and you'll make more money if you take more time off. And I was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. How am I going to make more money by taking more time off? She goes, have we led you astray on anything else? I'm like, no. She's like, will you just start taking some more time off? So I started taking time off, which was a lot like, I think probably what it's like to get over a crack addiction, you know? Um, I remember scheduling a snowmobile outing because I knew in the mountains I couldn't get the phone service with my cell phone. 
I told the guys I went with, I'm not allowed to make any calls or emails. I'm supposed to be away from the office fully for 24 hours. I thought the world was going to implode. You know, I thought like every client was going to have an emergency. Like I just had all these crazy notions and it was a little bit tough, but then I got really good at it. I was taking Wednesdays off and I realized none of my friends had a Wednesday off. So I was like hanging out. My wife was a school teacher. I was like, maybe Wednesdays aren't the best day right now to be taking off. But I, I, I got pretty good at it. And after the first year of taking all these days off, I made 170,000 more dollars. I was like, damn, you know what it came down to? It was this. You get much more strategic about what you delegate and how you let other people help you when you take time away. That's the first thing. The second thing is, there's something called diminishing marginal productivity. Diminishing marginal productivity is when you just get exhausted and worn out. Think of it as like an, an athlete. You know, sometimes if they're going into overtime and everything, their legs start cramping up and they start getting extra fatigue. That happens in business. We get this mental fatigue. We get in these ruts and routines. We might be spending more time there, but being less effective. So by taking time off, you come back refreshed and guess what? When you're refreshed and rejuvenated, your best ideas come and your best ideas are what drive the vision. And remember, vision is what drives the value. So some of the best things that most business owners can do is take time away from the business because then other people step up. I remember starting Strategic Coach, calling my assistant Amy and saying, okay, I'm going to fly to Chicago. I'm not allowed to be in contact with anyone um, in the office during the entire trip. So when I get back, we'll get back in touch. I landed, turned on my phone, seven messages already from Amy. Now, we could blame Amy, but the real truth of the matter was it was all my fault because that's what I had told her to do is bring everything to me. So I kept, like, as difficult as it was, I didn't get in touch with her until I finally got home. But the second I landed in Salt Lake, I made the call, and I was like, okay, let's go through all this. She's like, go through what? I'm like, well, all your messages. She's like, no, I got it all handled. It's all done. Right? So take time off. Think about what would make life enjoyable. What makes you happy? What are some of the hobbies, the interests? Is it travel? That's why I'm going to spend two months in Italy. It's like, when else will I have a chance with my kids at 9 and 11 to go and learn a different language, meet some of my family that doesn't even speak English, and just kind of relax and, and have some friends over and you know, have four-hour European dinners, how that type of thing goes? Like That's better than waiting for 30 years from now, you know? which who knows what's gonna happen because I had two business partners that died in a plane crash in 2006, right? Now, I learned really well from these guys because just a month before the plane crash, Les, one of my partners, came to me and he said, you know, I can't imagine life being any better. I love my life. I remember him saying that so distinctly and it was actually so much easier to accept him dying at age 35 based upon that conversation. See, because when I first met them, I was smart in some ways, but dumb in others. Like they liked having me around because I researched, I, you know, I could present well, some of these kind of things. But at the same time, they would, we'd go to Hawaii and I would, I would spend less in Hawaii than I would spend if I was still in Utah. It's like, well, we don't need meals. We'll just eat, we'll bring our own snacks there, you know? Like they're off on the beach, hiring photographers, doing night diving, and I'm judging the hell out of them. Like what wasteful, like they're hurting their net worth. You know, I, I had read, I had read The Millionaire Next Door. Anyone read The Millionaire Next Door? Spoiler alert if you haven't read it. If you're willing to be a miser, you can leave behind millions of dollars for people to blow within three years, like I said before, right? The Millionaire Next Door mindset is what I had early on developed where I just thought if I never spent any money that there would be a whole bunch. But for what reason? To look at dots on a piece of paper? To brag about my statements? I mean, if you never utilize it, what good is it? And so fortunately, these guys really helped me kind of break free from that and start to live a lot better life. And I started making more money, taking more time off, making account. And now I can think about things like what I wrote and what would the Rockefellers do, which is like, okay, what would I want to transfer to the next generation so my great, great, great grandkids would know my name, what I stood for, and have it impact their life because it would be about philosophy, contribution, values, things that can translate, not just money. That's what make it count is about. What are the experiences that you want to have in life? We've chosen as our make it count, we always have a trip on the books to look forward to. Because every now and again, life gets hectic. You know, I've got a nine-year-old that acts just like me, so you can imagine the handful that he is. He now has green hair. Um, must want to be a rock star too. You know, the 11-year-old, very high-maintenance kid, loving, super sweet soul, but, you know, everything's just a little extra time, a little extra attention when it comes to school. So... I want to spend some time with them now. 
I want to do things that would be enjoyable, and I want to, when those things are difficult, I want something to look forward to because it's on the books. That's what make it, make it count is. I'm never going to invest another penny in the stock market. As a matter of fact, I stopped investing in the stock market in the year 2000 when it started to go down. Now, as we really look at this, this has become synonymous with investing. People think stocks. A few people think about real estate, but for the most part, we've been taught that when we save or invest, it should go into the stock market, that it's an investment in the future of our country, that it's an investment in the corporations. But as we start to dive in, how many of these corporations, A, would you even want to support? And B, is it really investing or is it a lot more like speculation and gambling? Where else in your life would you go and do something that fell 9 out of 10 times? I've never got an airplane that's failing 9 out of 10 times, or a car for that matter. I wouldn't do anything that's failing 9 out of 10 times, and yet that's what we're being trained, taught, and educated when it comes to investing. I sat down with one of my clients, and he's a close friend of mine, and actually uh, is a doctor of mine for the last 13 years. And as I'm talking to him, you know, he's looking at potentially making an investment in the stock market. It was really measuring, should he pay off a loan, or should he invest in the stock market, or do something else? Now he happens to own a business that he's recently expanded. He's brilliant at what he does. He adds massive value out there in the world with that. And so that's one option of where he could invest more money. Another option is because the economy right now is fairly unstable, it's been growing for an extended period of time. It's the second longest period of time in US history since we've had a recession. And so he feels it might be a little bit overvalued and I tend to agree with him. Or he could put it in the stock market in companies he doesn't know, he doesn't own, he he doesn't control and hopes that they might have a return sometime in the future. Now he's got people in his ear that are trying to sell him a product, which is a variable annuity, and that variable annuity can participate in the stock market, but there's certain fees associated with that, and by paying those fees, he gets some degree of guarantees, but those fees eat away a lot of the returns. In the world of investing, and especially retirement planning, we've been taught that we really should accumulate money, that we should set it aside, that we should be in there for the long haul. But the reality is, as we sit there and wait, we lose potential time value of money, where it could grow if it has losses. We don't understand the outcomes or the exit strategies a lot of times, like how do we actually benefit? When do we benefit? Why will it grow? Is this really the right thing to do for our money? And if we dive even a little bit deeper, here's another issue. What if there's companies out there that you would never go buy something from, or you don't even like what they're up to or what they're doing, or you might even think, you might think completely different and against that. And at the same time, you might be funding that kind of a thing when you buy a mutual fund, which is gonna be a collection of stocks, right? Or when you put your money in an index fund, which is less managed, and it's just what are the top 500 companies, for example, in the S&P 500 index. And as time goes on, you're hoping that it grows, but what if it doesn't grow at the rate that you were promised? Now, if we look at investors like Warren Buffett, See, Warren Buffett goes out there and he buys a company or he buys a stock, but now he owns the company because he's the major shareholder. He's got billions of dollars to allocate. He's got billions of dollars of cash right now. And he gets a 22% return year in and year out because he does it completely different than the speculators, than the gamblers, than the rest of the world that is just handing their money over and hoping that it works out because we have no control over what happens with the management team of that company. We don't walk in and command any degree of like, hey, this is what you need to do next, and if you don't, then you're fired, but that's something that he can do. He is more of a business owner than a traditional investor. He's not just putting money in a retirement plan, he's allocating enough cash that they can go implement their investment philosophy and when they implement that philosophy, there's a lot to learn there. So let's look at that for a minute. They might go in and focus on how can they increase the value of this company. Therefore, increasing the value of the stock, they've got a degree of control, they've got a team that comes in, and when they implement that methodology, yes, those companies grow a lot of times because they put more on fewer people. My uncle actually worked for a company that Warren Buffett bought, and then his job as a VP basically became firing everyone. That was tiring to him. He's asking people to take on more work without more compensation because that's gonna drive the price up. So shareholder value is where investors or even a CEO has a fiduciary responsibility. They're responsible for doing everything they can to increase the value of that stock, which might be putting a lot, of, you know, a lot on, on workers, 
It might be cutting expenses and then adding that work to those individuals. It might even be that, you know, that we're going out and doing things at the harm of the end user. We've seen this with Big Pharma and there's documentaries out there where they would go and they would buy some company that had a patent on a life-saving important drug and then they would jack the price up 5,000%. You heard about that maybe with the EpiPen or with other type of medication where people had rare diseases where if they didn't take it, they died. They went from maybe a dollar a pill to spending $20 a pill or $50 a pill and then you saw people that their entire bill for the whole year was hundreds of thousands of dollars for that life-saving pill because their life it's important they go do that. That's a shareholder value. That's not value creation of saying, how does the company win and how does the end user win? That's a shareholder value that says, how does the company win at the expense of the end user? That's against my value system. I'm not excited about that. And look, we have tons of retirement planners. They're not thinking about it at this level of depth. They're just looking at what did this investment do over the last 10 years? What is the track record of this investment manager? And because it's synonymous that investing equals putting money in stock, there's been enough marketing and social agreement that so many of us have just followed suit. Another reason I don't invest in the stock market and I'll never invest in the stock market again is there's a lot of misinformation. For one, let's say we've got average return versus actual return. Average return is not what you're actually experiencing, it's just doing math. And math and money don't always equal the same thing. So if I had 100 grand and I lose 10%, I'm all the way down to $90,000. Now, if I earn 10% and they, I turn on the news and they say, the market's rallied, it's come back, you've earned your 10% back, I only made 10% on $90,000, which means I'm not back to my original $100,000 investment, I'm at $99,000, $1,000 short. But wait, it gets even worse. Because they don't refund the fees they charge to manage that money. Right? Even if it's an index fund, there's some degree of fees. If it's inside of a retirement plan, there's also legal fees, admin fees, you know, all sorts of additional fees on top of what you're paying for the funds. And so I might be down at $96,000 because of all the fees that have now come out of the plan. I don't like that type of a situation. I think the economy is too volatile to be risking my capital. And I don't like the notions of, oh, well, you know, dollar cost average. If you haven't heard of the dollar cost average term, all that's saying is put your money in every single month because sometimes the market's up, sometimes it's down, and you're gonna buy at an average price if you just consistently put your money away. The mantra, invest early, often, and always. Right? Regardless of the outcome, if you're just patient enough, if you just write it out, it should be okay in the long haul. But let's look, how many people are actually okay in the long haul? When you look at people that are investing their money that are older than you, or if you're a retiree and watching this, did it work out how you wanted? Interest rates have been so low for so long, that's been great for business owners and borrowing money. It's been kind of terrible for those people that are out there going, hey, I'm trying to earn interest for retirement income and be safe with my cash. So that's been part Part of the letdown. So if we look at Enron, this company that was a big time energy company that you'd hear about all the time, it was just fabricating their numbers. They weren't creating actual value. They were lying in order to create false shareholder value. But as soon as everybody knew it was a lie, and once that was exposed, it went from being worth a bunch of money one day to being worth nothing overnight. Because when you're buying on the first end, right, on the IPO, when it first comes out, the initial public offering, there's a value that's set and it either goes up or down from there. So you can determine whether you want to buy it. After that, you're buying it on the secondary market, either through a mutual fund or through that individual stock. You're buying from someone who's already bought it before, and that's only worth what people are willing to pay for it. Now, if all of a sudden they know it's a lie, they know it's a fraud, they're not willing to pay anything for it. It's only buying on the information that we have access to. And there's so much information out there. There's so many things happening. There's so many degrees removed from what's actually going on versus what's being reported on the news. And we're taking far too much risk. Now, if this was working, that would be one thing. But it's not. It's been a failed financial experiment, a failed financial system. And this is why we're not seeing people become more financially independent. This is why we're seeing people work so hard hard, take all that hard work and set capital aside in something they don't know or understand, which is highly speculative and risky, and then getting to the place where they don't have time for the money to grow anymore because now it's retirement time and they live a worse lifestyle than expected. That's not a retirement dream. It's a retirement nightmare. I'll give a second example on that. See, if you had $1,000 and you earn 100%, it grows to 2,000 bucks. That's awesome. But if the next year it loses 50%, 
50% off of 2,000 takes you back to 1,000. That's a 0% rate of return. See, averages, that's a like if a, this morning I decided to take a shower and I had two shower heads, one on my left and one on my right. I turn one freezing cold and the other one scalding hot. On average, I'm at a lukewarm temperature, but in reality, I'm miserable as hell. And so I wanna help you to understand what's really going on with your money. Me, I'm not such a good you know, stock market investor. I don't wanna read about that every single day. I don't wanna watch CNBC. I didn't even wanna watch it before I went on to be a guest on CNBC. It's just not what I enjoy hearing about that technical analysis every day. It doesn't enhance my quality of life. And before you're even allocating money to investing, and unfortunately maybe calling it saving, I think it's important to build six months of your savings and set this money aside so that when there is that inevitable surprise that happens in our life, it doesn't have to derail us, it doesn't have to destroy us, it doesn't have to become overly stressful. If you have double digit interest rates, why not pay off that high interest rate and get that guaranteed savings, improve your cash flow, have less stress, that's another thing you can do. And invest first and always in yourself. What can you do to increase your skill set? You know, really determine your abilities. Add more value with everything you do. This is a different way of thinking about investing when you invest in you. When you invest in the things that you can do that add more value that, and give you more money. Dollars follow value. So how can you become a better value creator? How can you be more aligned with the things that you do with your money? We vote with our dollar every single day. So let's review a few things. Number one, saving is different than investing. Saving is setting money aside that's available, that you have access to, that's stable and secure. Not a big rate of return on that. If any, it's pretty negligible in today's world. Where investing is, you're allocating something maybe to create cash flow, maybe to create growth, but it's less predictable, probably a, deg a higher degree of risk overall. And because you don't know what those outcomes are, if the economy goes down, that investment might go down and that money might not be available to you. And if you're in a cash crunch because because of the economy turning, you might have to liquidate that at a time where it's a lower value and that is part of the problem here. So I stopped in 2000 when the market started to go down and I couldn't explain how long it was going to go down, why it was going down, why these companies were valued at one thing one day and did have a totally different value the next day, I realized was more of a perception and a perspective than it was reality. I don't put money in the stock market because I don't have control over those companies when I buy those stocks. As a matter of fact, if I have 500 companies, I'm not reading all the reports. I'm not excited about everything that's going on inside of those boardrooms. I'm not sure how sustainable their initiatives are. I'm not sure what technology is coming out that could disrupt everything and make that company more obsolete. And so ultimately, I don't like to invest where I don't have knowledge. I call that more gambling than investing. And then when you look at it, and it's failing nine out of 10 times, that Americans are getting to retirement, yet they're not able to retire off their retirement plans that are fueled primarily by the stock market, something is wrong here. You can go to wealthfactory.com forward slash investing. You're gonna find out things in this guide that I'm gonna to contribute to you on seven ways to invest like an entrepreneur. The compound interest is not the miracle some say it is. You can figure out, should you pay off your mortgage early or not? And that really depends on who you are. How do you protect your investments so when the market goes down, you don't watch your money go down with it and leave your pocket and go into someone else's because money's never lost, it's merely transferred. If what your bank taught you about money was true, then everyone would be rich. There are nine specific myths that people hold about money and it's time to break them. Myth number two, put all your money in a 401k and wait 40 years for a big return, also known as the long haul mindset. Long haul, does that sound fun? It just sounds miserable. It sounds like the worst workout ever invented. When does the long haul end, by the way? Yeah, I guess when you die. That doesn't sound very good, right? But then maybe your heirs or your pets or whoever happens to be alive, they're gonna be told they're in the long haul because it's the ideal excuse for people who want you to hand over your money, right? They say, oh, you're in it for the long haul, which means no accountability, not measuring what's happening today and getting you to think so long-term, it's to your detriment. See, part of the thought process here is that we're trained, taught, and educated that high risk equals high return. But risk defined is chance of loss. So how by increasing your chance of loss, is that gonna bring you a higher return? When people are telling you high risk equals high return, how much risk do they take? Well, if you're giving your money and they're getting a fee no matter what happens to that money, or even bailed out by the government, they didn't take any risk because the game was rigged for them and rigged against you. So what do you do instead? It's time to be a cash flow investor. It's time to have enough cash to cover your expenses. I call this economic independence. It is a game changer. 
assets producing cash flow covering your basic expenses. So you don't have to actively work on a daily basis to cover your bills. When you have that freedom, work is a choice. When you have that freedom, you can swing for the fences in what you do. You can think more clearly about what you want your life to look like and what your vision is and what you want to be remembered for and what that purpose is on a daily basis without money coming in and crashing the conversation or keeping you up at night or being something that is a destroyer of dreams, which it is for far too many people that don't understand it. But I can you because you're watching this and you're gonna make a difference when you got that cash flow that can cover your expenses it is such a game changer because you've already won the game now you choose how you want to play we've been really kind of bamboozled with this thought process I call accumulation you hear it in the vernacular people say this all the time accumulate wealth accumulation is slow dogmatic dangerous and it's a concern because the US Department of Labor says 95% of the time People are not economically independent in the United States at age 65, meaning they don't have enough cash to come in to cover their basic expenses. Accumulation theory is the enemy here. It's the villain. It's hard work with the wrong philosophy leading to bad results. And think about it. How much time do you spend worrying or working or doing all this to have a better life in the future and even neglecting a better life today because accumulation is a cousin to budgeting, which is all about scrimping, sacrificing, saving, and delaying and deferring and one day and someday and that notion sickens me and it's time to release you from that so you can actually utilize your cash along the way you can keep your money in motion you can focus more on cash flow because cash flow is king net worth is great if it boosts your cash flow but if it doesn't and we only think about building net worth which is how much is our assets versus our liabilities and the more net worth we have yes that's great on paper but does that convert to dollars in your bank account is that coming in on a monthly basis or do you have to liquidate it and sometimes trying to liquidate net worth so you have enough cash to live is difficult during recessionary times or maybe you own assets that aren't highly liquid maybe it's a certain type of real estate or maybe it's a business or maybe it's something that's a private investment and there's not a big market for it one of the nice things about the stock market is it's really liquid meaning I can cash that in pretty much at any time it just depends on what other people feel it's worth but it moves very quickly so I don't want you to live like a pauper I don't want you to have to scrimp and budget and save so that one day someday the long haul pays off and find out when you get there it's not a retirement dream it's a retirement nightmare so long haul investing really takes away this responsibility and accountability for individuals and unfortunately people are funding these plans like retirement plans um, 401ks IRAs RSPs in Canada these types of plans and at the same time it's not performing as well as they expected they might be borrowing on credit and by borrowing on a credit card you're paying a higher interest rate on your credit card just to fund a plan that you can't touch till at least 59 and a half but even then you have to pay tax so most people never want to pay that tax and they never get to access that money and unfortunately what if you're paying a higher interest rate than you're earning that is a game that's never going to work out in your favor or what happens if all of a sudden you have a financial surprise and we're all in store for financial surprises but you have a financial surprise a health issue a family issue um, you know you, you transition jobs or your business doesn't do what you expected I mean I had business partners that died in 2006 that meant our processing accounts our merchant accounts got shut down and we couldn't process business for a while because we were all in the same accounts and so that was a big hit not only did they die I couldn't actually have money coming in and all of a sudden if I was all dependent upon net worth I would have to liquidate more valuable assets quickly therefore selling at a lower price now here's the lesson there if you've got cash you can make money on the buy so you know in 2008 same thing happened you know a lot of people they had to borrow to survive they had plenty of net worth and they were rich that way but they were cash flow poor and that ended up destroying their, their net worth because they had to sell assets just to live so let me break this down into three major flaws and problems with retirement plans including the sacred cow of them all the 401k when I say sacred cow it's like an unquestioned belief the masses believe in it see a lot of times people are so caught up in the tax advantages but it's actually tax deferral not tax deductions you put money into pre-tax into the retirement plan and then you defer that into the future well number one what if taxes go up in the future the government is 23 trillion in debt or hopefully you're making more money in the future because if you don't make more money in the future inflation makes it hard to buy the same amount of things today 10 20 and 30 years from now 
So anyone that tells you you should be able to live off 70% of your income, either A, doesn't own Amazon Prime, because I bought a lot more since I've had that, or B, they're setting you up for failure. There's people in the 1980s that thought if they had a quarter of a million dollars in a retirement plan, that would be suffice today. That's not even close. People aren't able to be economically independent off 250 grand. Interest rates have been too low. Things, even if they have, people have a million dollars and they're so-called millionaires, if they're in retirement, how much interest are they getting from that? And by the time they pay taxes, they feel more like a, in poverty level, not wealth level, because a millionaire doesn't mean you get to spend a million dollars. The second issue I have here is compound interest has a compound cost. So if you have money, a hundred grand, and you invest it for 10 or for 30 years at 10%, grows to 1.74 million. Woohoo! Exciting. That's compound interest. 30 years, it looks really good. But what if there's some fees that come along with that, with that retirement plan or with the mutual funds or whatever's funding it? So you only earn 9.2% instead of 10. Grows to 1.4 million. That's over a $300,000 cost to your bottom line. Compound interest also has compound cost. So we've gotta be really calculated about taxes and costs and fees. Look, look up and learn what a 12B1 fee is or an expense ratio or legal fees or admin fees or a myriad of fees that could confiscate your wealth. The third part is a lot of these are hidden fees, right? They're not things that we think about every single day. We just look at what did the average rate of return in the stock market come out to be. But averages and actual returns are two separate things. Averages don't account for fees. So in business, we call that revenue. You could have a great revenue and be like, oh, I make $100 million in revenue, and that sounds great. But if it costs you $101 million of revenue to get to the $100 million, not so great anymore. You're losing money. So we've really got to detect and understand almost like a financial detective. What are the fees? What are they costing you? Because this really starts to add up. So what can you do instead of long haul investing? Well, first and foremost is to invest in yourself. Figure out your skill sets, your talents, your abilities, whatever you might call it, and invest in that so that you can add more value out into the world. The more value you can add to the more people, the more money you can actually make. And if you own a business, you can invest back into that business, whether it's into people, so you have very best people around you that free you up to do what you do best, the right processes that support those people to become more efficient, or the right technology and procedures that allow you to have automation so you have even more reach and you can make more money through scale and leverage. Another thing that you can do other than just subject yourself to long haul investing, the buy, hold and pray, hope it works out. You can get crystal clear on your purpose in life. What is it that you really are up to and want to do? And what if you funded your dream instead of everyone else's? Rather than thinking about investing early, often and always, rather than thinking that the earlier you start, the more you'll have in the future, and you rob that money from your own purpose and your own abilities. See, I want you to think about investing first and foremost in yourself, and then secondarily, let's get really efficient with your money. Let's pay off higher interest rate loans. Let's get better interest rates with your loans. Let's build up some savings accounts so you have staying power, and if there's any financial surprise, you don't have to go into debt or go borrow to handle that situation. So you've invested in yourself, you've invested in your basic infrastructure, and then you're gonna have more abundance because you've gotta take care of yourself, your family, and have a high quality of life because you're your greatest asset, not a stock, bond, or piece of real estate. Don't neglect yourself. If you sacrifice your whole life to get the reward at the end, you're taking a serious risk that when you get there, it won't be what you expected it to be. Make your money work for you right now. Instead of putting it off until one day, or even someday way in the distant future, now you can actually invest in yourself because you have the knowledge to transform your thoughts into profits and build the life that you love. If what your preachers, teachers, and family and friends taught you about money was true, I think everyone would be rich. There are nine specific myths that hold people back when it comes to money. It's time to break those. Myth number seven, spend as little on insurance as possible. Look, there's only two things you do with insurance. You either you know, buy it and transfer risk or you retain the risk yourself. I have a buddy, Darren, that argues with me on this. He says, no, you can avoid risk, but some things you just can't avoid and it changes behavior. How can you make protection productive? That's the question here. And how can you minimize your cost of insurance so you have a lot more wealth? See, because my mom, when we were growing up, I remember her writing the bills and sending checks out back in those days and she's like, we're insurance poor. I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, all the money we earn goes to insurance. I thought, those SOBs, that sucks. I hate insurance companies. What I found is none of us really hate insurance. 
We all just hate paying for it. If insurance didn't cost us anything, I think we'd all be cool getting as much as we possibly can. So look, if you don't transfer risk, you have insurance, but it's called so-called self-insurance. And that's a complete myth because you're either insured or not insured. And if you have to use your assets to insure something, you're spending at least a dollar for that dollar of insurance. Let me give an example. Let's just say that you went out and you paid off your mortgage. So now you have a free and clear home. You don't have to have homeowner's insurance. But if you drop that homeowner's insurance and it saves you $2,000 a year and your home is worth $500,000, well, guess what? You now have to have $500,000 locked away somewhere. And do you think you could maybe produce more than $2,000 a year off $500,000? I think with measly in, you know, savings accounts maybe, but even if you look at better investments that might not be fully liquid, well, if they're not fully liquid, meaning you can invest it in a business or in a person or in an idea or in a strategy that might lock that capital up for periods of time, you would now be completely exposed if something happened to your home. And if something happened to your home, you would now derail yourself or destroy that money you have to just rebuild it. So sometimes the cheapest way to insure is to buy as much as possible. What the hell do I mean by that? What I mean is if these companies are truly efficient and effective what they do, and I'm gonna show you how to design it properly, you can transfer risk to them so you free up your cash to use, to invest, and to grow, and you're gonna spend less than a dollar for a dollar of insurance, where if you use your own cash, you're gonna spend at least a dollar of insurance for that dollar of protection in the so-called self-insured world. So how do you get as much insurance as you can and then lower your cost economically and improve your situation. Well, first off, when you transfer risk, it definitely brings about peace of mind. I bought this 3.5 Acura RL. It was the first car I ever bought. I didn't know it was insured because I was on mom and dad's insurance before. And when I took it off the lot, I started to go, this isn't insured and I hated every driver. I didn't enjoy the drive to get into the house because I thought it was gonna get crashed and that I was now gonna have this loan and I'm gonna have to pay that back and I don't even have the car I want. So that became a destructive mindset. Like what if you had the most amazing car? Let's say you loved Bentleys and you bought a Bentley, but you also had a beater truck. The Bentley wasn't insured, but the beater truck was, and you had to make a long trip. Which car are you probably gonna drive? Well, you might be too worried about, hey, if something happens to my precious Bentley, then I'm screwed because it's not insured, so I guess I'll buy the beater truck. See, whether you claim on insurance or not, whether you have the incident or not, there is still value there. What I'm trying to do is free up your cash so it can be truly invested and grow instead of in this scarcity thinking, trying to minimize your cost of insurance and use your own cash. See, one moment of scarcity in your mind can crowd out prosperity thinking. When I was driving my car, what if I would have had my best financial idea, but instead I'm worried about every other driver? Being self-insured means keeping enough cash on hand to equal what you'd be insuring, plus enough to replace it at full value. That's a lot of cash that you can't do anything with if you actually want to use it. So let's talk about this. How can you actually insure your assets and improve your financial structure? Well, one, you can start to lower your cost of insurance if you do remove duplication. An example of duplication would be if you have a car and a home, you can actually add an umbrella policy to the car and the home, have it cover multiple cars or even multiple homes if you have multiple homes with one policy and get the minimum required for that umbrella policy to kick in. I've seen people have more than minimum required and that's just a duplicate coverage. So an umbrella or excess liability coverage would be one way of doing that. Or let's say you have enough cash on hand. And you don't need short-term disability because if you were disabled for a short period of time, you'd have enough cash to handle it. This is how savings accounts can provide for you. You could drop that short-term insurance and only go with long-term insurance because the first dollar of insurance that you purchase is the most expensive. A low deductible or no deductible will be a more expensive policy because you're more likely to use it. And they care more about the use of the policy than how big the claim is. So what we wanna do is minimize the frequency and maximize the protection. Let me say that really simply. Protect the catastrophic, never the inconsequential. Take care of anything small by not having insurance. If it doesn't derail you or destroy you, if you can write a check for it and go to sleep that night, you don't have to worry about it. And then transfer all the catastrophic things because the least expensive dollar of insurance is the last dollar. Like a million dollar umbrella might cost a couple hundred dollars a year because the likelihood of tapping into that million dollar is really small. But a low deductible of zero or a hundred dollars on a car might raise your premiums 50, 60, 70 dollars a year because you're more likely to use it. So don't use insurance for things that you can handle on your own. Use it to protect your legacy, to protect your mindset, and to transfer major risk, not the minimum risks. So let's look at three ways to maximize insurance. One is 
understanding human life value versus property value. Property value are cars, their homes, are the things that we touch, right, and that we see. Human life value is human beings. That's disability, that's death, that's liability. See, human life value is usually underprotected, and property value is usually protected pretty well because it's pretty easy to see. But what's more valuable, you or your property? So start by human life value protection. So the liability, disability, medical, and life insurance, but you want to get long-term elimination that you can afford as have enough cash before the disability kicks in, right? Or umbrella policies that only have minimum limits of liability on the car and home when that kicks in so that it's more efficient. And then medical, if you can get health savings accounts or you can put money in pre-tax or you can minimize the premiums that are through co-ops or things like that so you keep more of what you make that way. And then life insurance, it's really about what would be the economic loss if something happened to you. Make sure you have the right amount protecting that to replace your income because even if you have millions of dollars of life insurance, that might not be that much money. Think about if you could never earn another dollar the rest of your life. Would you be okay with how much life insurance you have being your entire way to fund that future? So how much would it take to make sure your heirs either can live the same lifestyle or even a better lifestyle, but you can have caveats where they can't remarry and stuff like that and get the money, but you can have a little bit of control over that through a trust. Second thing is now you can look at protecting your assets. So your homeowner's insurance, right? Your car insurance, these types of things. You just wanna make sure that you have the limits of liability even between the two, higher deductibles overall, so you're not paying too much, and that you have the replacement value with your homeowner's insurance. So if something happens, they replace all the property at what it would cost to replace it, not the actual cash value. So replacement versus actual cash value. And get a video showing like everything you have is an in inventory in the home. Keep it in the cloud or outside of the house. So if anything happens, you have proof of what you had because I, I, I met with a doctor back in 2002 in Seattle and he had a cabin burned down had no documentation because it was brand new and there was an issue with how it was built and so it took him forever to get that back. I had a video guy that had went and taken an inventory of all of his property and when his apartment complex burned down he was the first one to get the money back and got the most money back of anyone there because he had it documented. So insurance becomes permission for you to invest and utilize your money instead of having your money become your insurance in so-called self-insured. You're either insured or you're not insured. Insure the catastrophic, not the inconsequential, because if you have homeowner's insurance in this example, you can now go invest that money rather than using your money to protect your home. Use insurance for what it's meant for as a permission slip to utilize your money. And then finally, insure the right things Insure the right things. Don't insure things that you can write a check for that wouldn't infringe upon your mind and are inconsequential because it's costly and it's unnecessary and it's inefficient. You know, you can learn a lot more about this because this chapter is a big deal. I've had very savvy financial people read this chapter and be like, oh, I never thought of insurance this way, of transferring risk and being permission to utilize my cash or freeing up my mind so I can think more abundantly and not be in scarcity and fear and doubt and worry all the time. So you can learn more about this in Killing Sacred Cows. So insuring the right things for you means learning what matters to you. You don't want to be stuck worrying about your assets and your life when by simply insuring those things could have taken care of that worry and eliminated that so you'd be more abundant. And start investing your time and energy in places that will bring you even greater returns as you become more of an investor rather than a Scrooge-like saver. A few years ago, I inherited a stock portfolio that has a total value of approximately $300,000. Okay. I don't understand the stock market, nor do I trust it. Welcome to the club, Michelle. <laughs> as a retiree- You just trust it more than not trust it. You know I, enough now being around me. You're, you're <laughs> fired up. You're calling your family. I am. I've been trying to educate everybody I know, and they're just like, well, you know, it's low, so I think I'm just going to buy more. And I'm just like, you know, if someone would have just listened to me a few months ago because of what I've learned from How you, you would have been, been in a pet, better position. At the top of my lungs. It was October of 2019 where I was like, where we hosted a virtual trend summit. We were mm -hmm. calling it. I said I was retiring at the end of 2020. Yeah. If I was wrong. That's mm -hmm. how much of a stake I was putting on it. I was on Fox News with Neil Cavuto, August right. of 2008, saying the stock market's overvalued. Stop funding your retirement. It's time to move to cash. And people thought I was nuts. And within the next two weeks, there was a 14% drop. And then it just That's went wild. down for two more years. Like, I don't know how to predict all this. I Like, let, let me be clear. I didn't know that real estate market was going to dive as fast as it did in 2008. I thought it was overvalued. But 
when lending changes, mm -hmm. it happens quickly. When a coronavirus happens, it, things happen quicker than you can predict, yeah. even if you have the most brilliant minds on mm -hmm. things. And even what I'm realizing as I continue to learn about all of this is there are so many variables and you don't know what is going to trigger the downturn. Right. And it could just be based upon an emotion or a perception. Like, I fear something's going to happen. So then people panic and make decisions, and there's a massive impact on the stock market. I read this report uh, one of my mentors sent me. Um, it was from McKinsey, the big consulting group. Mm -hmm. And it was they were flat out, I don't know how many years ago it was, but they were saying, we are in for something massive and major on a global scale. It's mm. coming our way. We don't mm -hmm. know what it is, but based upon all our models and what we've seen with the history, and I was like, I was like, wow, it kind of sounds like sky is falling. But I, these guys are doing research behind mm -hmm. it, and here we are. Yeah, here we are. All right. Okay, and here we are to answer questions. Okay. So I'm going to start over from the beginning of our question yeah. so we catch it all. So Michelle says, a few years ago, I inherited a stock portfolio that has a total value of approximately $300,000. I don't understand the stock market, nor do I trust it. As a retiree living in Southern California, I'm afraid if I pull out all of the money out of the stock market, the tax implication would be worse than keeping it in there. I'm looking for a financial strategist to help me. Um, but in the meantime, do you have any advice that can help me? Uh, I'll, I'll go straight to the camera on this one. One, you can go to wealthfactory.com forward slash private if you're looking for a wealth strategist. We have investment advisors, wealth strategists that you could uh, meet. Number two, when we inherit money, there's something called a step up in basis. So capital gain assets like businesses, stocks, pieces of real estate, that can actually transfer and get a step up. So let's say this person that died paid 100 grand for these and now they're worth 300 grand. That's $200,000 of gain. But when it passes on, a lot of times there could be that step up in basis, which acts like $300,000 is what it was paid for. So that would mean that there might not be tax implications, especially with this downturn. It depends on what amount she inherited versus what it's worth right now. So yeah. you've got to learn about the step up in basis. Okay. okay. So that's, that's the first piece. I'll let you, is there anything you have? No, I don't. I'm a master interrupter. People <laughs> tell me all the time. So I'm, I, you know, I'm giving you space. You're always, you always have really good insights. Thank you. Um, the second piece to this is when we're putting our money somewhere and we don't understand it, we've got to stop calling that investing. The world has marketed to us, the whether it's Wall Street or retirement planners, the word investing, and it's first off been collapsed to, to count savings and investing in the same thing. Savings is we've got money set aside. It's available. It's not earning a high interest rate. It doesn't go down, but it's not going to go up a lot. That's savings. Investing is we're locking it away potentially. It could be volatile. It might have a bigger payoff in the future. There might be certain risks associated with it. But speculation or gambling is when we put money into something that we have no idea. Why would it work? When would it work? How would it work? How does it benefit us? What are the risks that involve with it? And if there's no risk management, then it's speculation. And look, institutions do a lot of risk management. Like, first off, if, if you go get a loan from a bank, they want a down payment. That's risk management. Um, they want an appraisal. That's risk management. They want to see your taxes and your credit score. They want to charge you private mortgage insurance if you don't put enough down payment. They, they want a lot of information to protect them on the downside. So that way, if you default, they know what the underlying asset is. If you've got a down payment, you've got more skin in the game. If you if you show that you've had a history of a certain income or a responsibility with your credit score, these are all factors that are risk management. And look, in Wall Street, this is what frustrates me. Interest rates are 0% with the Fed right now. And so now banks can borrow super cheap to nothing, and then they can still lend it out and earn an interest, right? But if they fail like they did in 2008, right. guess who bails them out, Stolba? You and I the and the rest payers. of the public. So yeah. this is bullshit when people say it mm -hmm. takes money to make money. Whose money does it take? Does it really, t do the is it the bank's money? Mm -hmm. No, no. No. They have they're our recycling money that our they're money. recycling out. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Good word. Then the, and, then, <laughs> and then they say high risk equals high return. When we put money in a retirement plan that we think we're taking high risk with growth funds, the person that's the manager, they have responsibilities, but they're getting paid a fee. The company that's issuing the, the, the talent, they're getting paid a fee on the entire portfolio, not on the cash that they put in, right. but on the portfolio. Mm -hmm. And if you lose, they, they still, still get a get fee it. on whatever is left 
over. Mm -hmm. They're not taking high risk to get high return. It's not taking their money to make money. And yet these faulty notions have rigged the game against people. Mm -hmm. They rigged the game against people because first we neglect cash flow. Second, we take on unnecessary risk that we don't understand the nature of that risk until we have a crisis like we're in today. And then it just frustrates and create bitterness, right? We have people that have high interest rate loans, yet they're funding their 401ks. Pay off those loans. Mm -hmm. We have people that are funding 401ks and retirement plans before they've even put three to six months of their own personal savings or before they've invested to figure out their own skill sets. This is what's frustrating. Now, this question about inheriting, like I love that she's just willing to admit, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't trust the stock market. Great. Yeah. Then it's time to figure out where you're going to invest. You've got to learn your investor DNA and understand what do you understand. Some people are great at real estate. Some people are terrible. A few people are good at stocks. Most people are terrible. Mm -hmm. Some people are good at businesses. Others are terrible. So if you don't know to invest, I think you got to look at things more like cash flow banking that have security and stability. Yeah. And you got to look for things that have more fixed interest or fixed income, which unfortunately with interest rates so low, isn't really exciting. It's not really great but it's better than losing yeah. and it's better than losing sleep and it's better than feeling this frustration. So first she might not have a tax issue, mm -hmm. right? And second, if you know you're gambling, it's time to move towards investing or saving. Yeah. That's the main advice. Mm -hmm. Now we know that she's a retiree, but we don't know if she's close to 59 and a half or she's older than right. 59 and a half. How does that change her circumstance? Yeah, and it, I don't know if it's in a retirement plan or just inherited the stocks. If it's in a mm -hmm. retirement plan, there might we might have a little bit different situation here okay. from a tax perspective. Yeah, good clarification. Right? Um, which those taxes might have been paid upon inheritance, um, or it could be through what's known as a stretch IRA, which might mean that the taxes are yet mm -hmm. to be paid until the until they're redeemed. Yeah. Or if it was just actual stocks, that's where that step up in basis can occur. Hey, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. And if you're enjoying these videos, well, there's good news. More where that came from. So go ahead and click through and watch the next video now.